We smell all the time, and we're quite good at it. While humans can distinguish at most several million shades of color, and can hear around half a million different tones, our noses trump both the eyes and the ears, being able to detect around one trillion different smells. Yet when you're browsing through your Instagram feed and or watching the newest season of whatever show one of the dozens of streaming services has churned out, it feels as though the roughly 6 million receptors in our noses are being underutilized. But for better or worse, it may not be that way for much longer. For decades, entrepreneurs with big dreams, bigger ideas, and little regard for what consumers actually want have been trying to bring the smells of the world to your phones, your movie theaters, and anything that can connect to the internet. It's time to usher in the future of smelling as we learn something new. But before we go to the future, we must first explore our past. And people have been trying to recreate smells they like to smell for a long time, with the earliest evidence of civilizations attempting to combine ingredients to replicate smells as far back as the second millennium BC in Mesopotamia. The early Egyptians would perfume their dead, assigning specific fragrances to deities. As much value as the religious side held, I also believe it may have been beneficial in combating the stench as they prepared the body for burial. The Egyptian perfumes would go on to influence the Greeks and the Romans and eventually would take us to the 17th century when doctors treating plague victims would don masks that contain cloves, cinnamon, and spices as they thought pleasant smells would protect them from disease. And with anything that reaches a certain level of pompousness, it wasn't long before the royals adopted it and claimed they did it best. Take France for example. France's King Louis XIV used perfume so much that he was called the Perfume King. His court contained floral pavilions filled with fragrances, and dried flowers were placed in bowls throughout the palace to freshen the air. Royal guests would bathe in goat's milk and rose petals, and visitors were often doused with perfume, which was also sprayed on clothing, furniture, walls, and tableware. It was also at this time that grass, a region of southern France where many flowering plant varieties grow, became a leading producer of perfumes. Meanwhile, in England, aromatics were contained in lockets and in the hollow heads of canes to be sniffed by whatever elite was fortunate enough to be born into a family that could afford it. It wasn't until the late 1800s, when synthetic chemicals started to be used, that perfumes could be mass-marketed. The first synthetic perfume was nitrobenzene, made from nitric acid and benzene. This synthetic mixture gave off an almond smell and was often used to scent soaps. In 1868, Englishman William Perkins synthesized curmin from the South American tonka bean to create a fragrance that smelled like freshly sown hay. But before long, people no longer wanted smelling to be an exclusive experience. Much in the same way silent film was often paired with a live piano player to engage your auditory sense, people wanted to find ways to pair smell with other experiences. The use of smell in cinema dates back to 1916, when the Family Theater in Forest City, Pennsylvania, filled the noses of an audience of a Rose Bowl game in the scent of rose oil. But with the introduction of audio in films, smell was forgotten by most, but not all. A man by the name of Hans Laub would go on to invent the smell vision a system that released scents connected to individual seats in movie theaters. He debuted the system at the 1939 New York World's Fair to a lackluster reception. For years, smell in theaters would slink back into the shadows until the producers of the 1960s mystery film The Scent of Mystery rediscovered Laub's technology and contracted him to perfect the technology into a smell brain. This was a series of perfume bottles with scents that were released into the theater automatically as the film threaded through the projector. To garner hype for the film, they ran ads saying, first they moved, then they talked, now they smell. That's some great marketing. The film was supposed to set up several clues to be conveyed through the sense of smell. For example, they had the assassin smoke a pipe with the crowd smelling tobacco as they tried to piece together the mystery for themselves. The heavy promotion led newspaper columnist Earl Wilson to write about the smell brain, saying it can produce anything from skunk to perfume and remove it instantly. But this wasn't quite true. In fact, it wasn't even close. The smell brain was buggy and far from a perfect system. Audience members in balcony seats found that the smells were delivered to them far delayed from when they were supposed to be, and other parts of the theater barely getting any smells at all, leading people nearby to complain of entire rows of loud compulsive sniffers trying to get enough of the scent to know what it was actually supposed to be. 
Over the years, numerous attempts to bring smell back to the cinema were tried and failed, including scratch and sniff cards that would give you the scent of a famous scene in a movie. And with the age of the internet, there were more people committed to the belief that the smell technology was the reason why it always failed, not from the lack of interest. There have been attempts at transmitting smell over the internet and out of the TV screens you would keep in your living room, but the use that's grown to be more popular than anything else is once again in the cinema. In looking for ways to enhance the viewing experience for moviegoers, 4DX films utilize motion seats and special effects including wind, fog, lightning flashes, bubbles, water, and most relevant, smells, to enhance the immersion for the viewer. In some of these movies, the smell can change as quickly as 30 seconds and typically involving less than 50 smells total so as not to overwhelm audiences. One company I found, Olorama, has made smell patterns for many films including Avatar, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Hobbit Trilogy, and all of the Hunger Games movies, as well as many others. Yet the future of smell technology may not lie with entertainment, but in helping people. OVR technology, or olfactory virtual reality technology, has made bold claims as to the importance of their device called ION, which fits over existing VR headsets. The company calls it the most precise device of its kind, and it's important why it should be. For training purposes, the ION device is used with first responders like firefighters. It can be used to mimic different odors a firefighter needs to be able to recognize when responding to dangerous situations. The obvious example here would be smoke, but there are many others such as different chemicals or gases that could impact the strategies needed to combat the flames. Another use of the technology is more therapeutic. OVR technology partnered with an organization known as Brave Mind, which helps combat veterans recover from PTSD using virtual reality therapy. The main use is for exposure therapy, where a patient is guided by a therapist through a retelling of their experience in a safe, controlled setting. The OVR technology serves to make the experience seem more real, helping trick the brain into letting the exposure therapy be more effective. You see, your olfactory bulb runs from your nose to the base of your brain, and has direct connections to your amygdala, the area of the brain responsible for processing emotion, and to your hippocampus, an area linked to memory and cognition. Neuroscientists have suggested that this close physical connection between the regions of the brain linked to memory, emotion, and our sense of smell may explain why our brain learns to associate smells with certain emotional memories. As much as the commercial use of smell technology has struggled to get off the ground, these companies do reflect a legitimate use for the technology that would allow it to go far beyond the confines of the entertainment industry, saving people by training first responders and helping people recover from their phobias and post-traumatic stress. What's important to realize when approaching the business model over and over again is that you have to understand what your consumers truly want. If the small percentage of moviegoers asking to smell their favorite movies doesn't justify the cost, then why force it? But there are many people out there struggling with phobias and mental illnesses, and if the technology can help them, then that's where the emphasis should be. And it's only taken us over 4,000 years to figure that out. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. I actually got the idea for this video from the intro I did for my last one, which goes through the Great Stink of 1858 when London suffered from horrible stenches causing the deaths of tens of thousands of Londoners. It led to the creation of one of the greatest and most underrated infrastructure projects of all time. If that sounds interesting to you, you can click here to watch it. And don't forget to subscribe for future videos. Thanks again, and as always, see you next time!